I want to encourage you to utilize the chat and Q&A functions during today's conversation, which I see you guys are already starting to do. And so with that, I'm proud to welcome today's speakers, Dr. Julie Miller and Asha Srikantaya. Welcome. Julie, starting with you, please introduce yourself and your role at MIT Age Lab. Hi, Hailey. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you to the Commerce uh, for inviting me on this panel. I'm really excited to be here. My name is Julie Miller, and I'm a research scientist at the MIT Age Lab. My background is in social work, and I'm really excited to talk about what student loans and planning for the future have to do with each other. Wonderful. Thank you so much, and welcome, Julie. Asha, you're up. Sure. Hello, everybody. My name is Asha Shrikantaya, and I work with Fidelity Investments. And for about five years now, uh, I've been looking very deeply at student debt and how it's impacting people and not just their financial lives, but also their, their lives at large. And so um, really using all of that information to help Fidelity come up with a variety of different products and services that can help people who have student debt and um, I kind of have my finger on the pulse of a variety of different ways that uh, student loan holders today can navigate their personal loan situation. So kind of the product and solution side of um, a lot of the research that Julie is going to first share with you. Wonderful. Thank you both. Um, now, Julie, I'll toss the mic back to you to start today's presentation. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So. What I would like to do now is to give you just a very broad overview of some of the ways in which we have been thinking about student loan debt, longevity planning, and family dynamics, where I work at the MIT Age Lab. So very briefly, what I do want to mention about the Age Lab is that we study things like transportation and livable communities, home logistics and services, caregiving and well-being, and retirement and longevity planning. Across all these different domains, things that we're really interested in are the T in MIT, so technology, technology adoption and integration, navigating complexities and how individuals and families make often very tough decisions and automation. So you may be hearing this and you may be thinking to yourself, okay, so what does student loan debt have to do with this? Well, around 2000 or 2015, 2016, when I was starting my dissertation research, I was seeing an increasing number of headlines like these. Headlines that in mainstream news sources were talking about not just the impact of student loans, but the impact of student loans on specific communities, including older adults, including women, including borrowers of color, and often the intersection of all of the above. And so it was becoming incredibly clear, incredibly quickly, that for us to really think about what it means not to just age uh, longer, um, and live longer, but to age and live better, that we need to be thinking about what repaying student loans has to do with the equation. And that's really where, where this research um, was born. And so I want to give you very, just a very broad overview of some of the findings from research that the Age Lab has conducted with TIAA. You can find um, all of these results and way more um, through the Age Lab website uh, and by some of the links that may wind up in the chat. So in general, um, what, what did we want to learn about? We wanted to learn about how carrying loans influences how people think about and plan for the future and how people may talk about or not talk about their loans with people in their lives. We also, of course, were interested in the different impacts of loans and what that has to do with borrowers ranging all the way from their 20s well into their 70s. We wanted to know about what it means to have loans for yourself, for someone else, uh, or for both. So with all that said, we first conducted focus groups with about 100 borrowers. This was at MIT in Cambridge. Borrowers between the ages of 25 and 75. Borrowers who either had a relatively small amount of loans or a relatively high amount of loans. And with these borrowers, we were able to understand um, real, real depth of, of some of the complex issues that they were facing. Then based on those focus groups, we actually conducted a national survey uh, with over 1800 borrowers. And so what I wanna do now is again, just give a very broad overview of what we found. First and foremost, we found that indeed student loan repayment does rival saving for retirement. 
we have seen time and time again research showing that carrying student loans can impact the timing at which people are able to buy homes, the timing at which people start families, um, the timing at which people may make uh, changes in their careers. We had seen less about how student loan debt impacts retirement saving for younger borrowers, for older borrowers, and everyone in between. So from our research, we found that 84% of the people in our study said that the loans had negatively affected the amount that they had saved for retirement. And in fact, that 73% of borrowers in our study expected to begin or increase their retirement con contributions af uh, after paying off their loans, meaning their loans were holding them back currently from, from contributing more. And interestingly, we also found that the higher one student loan debt, the lower one's financial self-efficacy. Financial self-efficacy, meaning their confidence in themselves as a consumer, as a purchaser, as a saver. This is really important. We also found that for some individuals more than others, that student loans acted as an elephant at the family dinner table. We found that about 37% of borrowers said that the student loans had negatively impacted their romantic relationships. We found that 23% of borrowers said that the student loans had led to conflict within the family. Don't let this fool you, however. This is from the national survey. And so do keep in mind that what we had heard before that with the focus groups from the other, let's say 80 or something so percent uh, of people said that, listen, while the loans hadn't created some kind of actual um, direct conflict within the family, that that idea of the elephant at the dinner table was that there were often things that were unspoken about the loans that were coming up in other kinds of ways in family dynamics. We found that just under 30% of borrowers in the national survey said that student loans had negatively impact their financial contributions to family members college. And so that could be to a spouse uh, or other loved ones college like children, for instance. And this is really important if we think about the generational impacts of student loans. And finally, what I want to share is that 16% of student loans have affected caregiving abilities. We know that millennials are actually one of the largest group of caregivers for older adults and people with disabilities in the United States. So if we think about not just the impacts of student loans on the individual themselves who has loans, but the ripple effects within the family and certainly to the overall economy, we're looking at some really staggering impacts. All of that said, and this is what I'll leave you with now and then shift over to Asha, what we heard by and large from people in our focus groups and in our survey, even after hearing about all of these often negative, though not only negative impacts of student loans, when we asked, all of this said, were the loans worth it? By and large, what we heard, yes, it was worth it for me to take out the loans. And that's really important as well. So with all that said, I'm going to shift over to Asha. And I'm really excited to, um, to hear what you have to say and then uh, have a great conversation. Julie, thank you so much. Um, so so I think we can maybe go to the next slide and I'll jump right in because so much of what you said resonates so deeply with all the things that we have learned over the years at Fidelity as well. So um, just as quick background, Fidelity also very similarly has been conducting both quantitative and qualitative research for several years now. And almost to the exact number, um, the stats that Julie just shared are also what we have found among our broader community. So to give you a sense of who we represent here and the numbers that you're seeing on this screen, um, we look at uh, a wide variety of 401k account holders across the country. And Fidelity actually services over 25% of the country's 401k accounts. So this is really kind of a representative cross-section of the American workforce at large um, and about a quarter of that workforce is kind of who we're, who we're looking at when we look at this data, um, many of whom then come in and use our tools and services around student debt. And everything that Julie just said is a lot of what inspired us to say as a company, yeah, we actually need to get in here and do something about this. Um, and we're not the only financial service provider who's now, who's now really deeply looking at student debt. So what I'm hoping to speak to you today about 
is what are various options and services available to you as borrowers if you are one of the 45 million people across the country who have student loans. Um, and as you can see, that, that's definitely true across all generations. So if we can go to the next slide here, um, this is also just to kind of bolster exactly what, what Julie was just saying as well. We have not only found that student debt is a cross-generational problem, we also are finding that it does in fact impact all industries um, and in very significant ways. So we can go to the next slide. So if you have student debt, then what options do you have? Um, so first things first, I think one of the things to know and understand is whether or not your, whether your loans are federal or private loans. Federal loans are actually the most common types of loans outstanding in the country. So over 92% of the debt outstanding in the United States is federal loan debt. And um, that's spread across undergraduate, graduate loans, and also parent plus loans are, are all considered to be federal loans. Um, so I think many of you might know that the the federal loan program due to COVID and the current pandemic and economic crisis that we're all experiencing in this country, the federal loan program actually came up with a very generous form of re loan relief over the course of this year. And so what the federal government did is they said that uh, all federal loans no longer actually have a minimum payment due over the course of this year. And furthermore, no interest is accruing over the course of this year. And that is actually valid until the end of this year, until December 31st. Um, that being said, given that you're not actually earning any interest, you're on that loan over the course of this year, um, it's a great opportunity if you're able to swing it to make any sort of extra payments towards your student loans. And the reason for that is because any extra payments that you're putting um, is going to really chip away at the principal balance on your loan. So it's gonna really maximize the amount that you can save in both time and interest on the life of your loan because you're not, you're not actually ratcheting up that interest daily um, like you otherwise would be. So bottom line takeaway on that, if you do have federal loans right now, um, obviously take, take advantage of the relief that the federal government has given you, but if you're able to make any extra payments towards it, um, many, my, including myself, would encourage you to try to do that. Federal loans also have a variety of different repayment programs that are available to federal loan holders, um, including income-driven repayment programs. So if you are somebody who has federal loans and you're looking to actually manage your monthly payments, you might consider getting on an income-driven repayment program, which is a way to actually ensure that your, that your monthly payment does not exceed a certain percentage of essentially your monthly income. And so there are a variety of different income-driven repayment programs out there. Some of them then even offer total forgiveness at the end of, um, at the end of a certain number of years. And so um, there are definitely things to check out there. And then the last thing that I'll say about federal loan holders and options available to you is public service loan forgiveness. So if you are working for a nonprofit institution, for any sort of governmental institution, whether that's local, state, federal, tribal, um, public service loan forgiveness is a program that was put into place um, in, uh, back in 2007. And the whole idea there is that if you make uh, 120 qualifying payments, you can then have the remaining outstanding balance of your loan forgiven. So the program itself is, uh, it does require a, a pretty big amount of paperwork. Some of that paperwork is getting log jammed with the federal government currently. So I do have to kind of just caution you uh, as to um, some of the some of the loopholes that, or sorry, some of the hurdles that you may have to um, work through to actually achieve that public service loan forgiveness. However, if you are able to achieve it, it can be an incredibly valuable gift back to our public service employees. And so that's also definitely something to check out. Now, if you have private loans, um, 
what I would recommend first and foremost is if you are looking to figure out a different option to repay your loans, if your current loan terms are not working well for you, the first thing that I would advise you to do is to talk to your servicer. So uh, I know people don't typically like picking up the phone and talking to their lender or their loan servicer, but quite often your loan servicer might be able to come up with um, a, a repayment program that might work a little bit better for your needs. Um, you might also consider refinancing your loans and refinancing is an option that's available for both federal loans and for private loans. But the whole idea of refinancing is you essentially take out one new loan um, to pay off all of your existing or some of your existing loans. And then now you're instead you're paying off that new loan. And the reason that that can be good is because your new loan may have a lower interest rate, for example, or your new loan may have a lower monthly payment that's more manageable for you. And so it's a way to really kind of reconfigure your loan makeup. Um, if that is if that is something that you are finding that you need to do. So I just threw a lot out there at you in terms of all the different types of options that are available to different loan holders who have student debt right now. But I wanna I wanted say that there are actually several resources that aggregate these types of different options together. And I'm just gonna show you one example of one. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, at Fidelity, we have created what we call the student debt tool, which is free to use for anybody out there. You do not have to be a Fidelity customer. Um, it is freely available and the link is here. And I think we're also going to make the link available in the chat. But what the student debt tool does is uh, it enables you to put in the data against all the loans that you have, and then it'll actually spit back out to you a personalized view of what your loan picture looks like and the various options that are available to you. And then furthermore, it actually does the math behind those options. So using a tool like this will help you better assess, okay, if you do refinance your loans, what could your new loan terms look like? And what would that actually do to your monthly payment or your balance over time? Um, Fidelity is not the only provider, of course, that has this type of service out there. There are several other tools and calculators, but um, you know, I personally believe in the tool that we have built. We put a lot of effort into this and have worked very closely with um, the federal, a variety of people who behind the federal student loan program and private student loans to make sure that that all of our math and everything properly works, um, so that so that you can really get a sense of what those options are. I think the benefit of using any sort of tool, whether it's Fidelity's or anybody else's, is that it helps you actually come face to face with the variety of loans that you have. And I think many people would say that that's really often the, the first and most valuable step that you can take towards really feeling empowered in the face of your loan. So kind of hearkening back to what Julie was talking about, about that idea of the elephant at the dinner table, one of the best ways to really address that elephant is to look at it square in the face and actively manage it. And um, any tool like this, whether it's Fidelity Student Debt Tool or any other will help you do that. The last thing I wanna talk about, if we can go to the next slide, is that there are also a variety of new programs that are emerging in the employer benefit space. And at Fidelity, we manage several of these programs for a variety of different employers across the country. Um, there are other providers like us out there who are working with other employers. And so all of this to say that it's becoming more and more popular for employers to help their employees very significantly with their student debt burden. And so if this is something that you feel would be beneficial, not only to you, but to your other colleagues, I would encourage you to reach out to your HR team and talk to them directly about it. Um, we're seeing that these types of benefit programs kind of manifest in a few different ways. So if you look on the left, what we call the direct type of program is when an employer directly contributes towards their employees' student loans, typically in the form of a monthly payment. So that might be $100 or $200 directly to the loan of your choice if you have student loans. Um, and that usually lasts you know, up to X number of years or up to 
$10,000. So the employer will kind of put that benefit package together. And then that's really an incredible gift because it's, it's a dollar amount over and above what you're paying out of your pocket. That's going directly towards your loans and helping you pay those down quicker. What we're seeing in the second is that there are more employers who are starting to get into this idea of enabling their employees to have more choice over their own benefits. So we're working with different employers who, especially this year, are seeing that you know taking vacation days was not as possible this year, not as popular. And so a lot of people have leftover vacation days and employers are now saying, hey, employees, you know, you can roll over your vacation days to next year if you would like, or you can actually cash those in in the form of a payment directly towards your student debt. And so we're seeing some really interesting ways that employers are starting to drive more choice to their employee base um, in order to kind of make your, your, your benefits work best for you as the employee. And so that's, that's kind of an interesting thing. And then the last, and again, this is kind of directly in the wheelhouse of what Julie was talking about when we think about longer term financial stability and student debt and the intersection of those two um, is what we call student debt retirement. So this is really based on that insight that many people are not able to save as much as they would want to save towards their retirement because of their student loans. And even further, there are many people who are not able to take advantage of their 401k match or their 403b match because of their student loans. And so what this type of program is doing is it's saying, employees, if you are paying towards your student loans on a monthly basis, we, the employer, we will look at how much you've paid towards your student debt and we'll apply that amount towards the match formula at your, at your company for your 401k. So in other words, if I work for a company, my company provides me with 3% match dollar for dollar into my 401k. Let's say I can't afford to pay towards my 401k this year because I am paying so much in loan debt and other financial priorities. I can actually show my company how much I have paid towards my student loans. And that then becomes um, the basis by which they match me. So if I'm Let's say at the end of the year, I have paid the equivalent of 2% of my salary towards my student loan payments. Um, they will then match me that 2% into my 401k account. So it's a really interesting way for um, employers to help their employees focus on retirement while the employee herself is focused on, on paying down her student loan debt. So it's a nice way to kind of blend the two financial priorities together. So I'm just going to pause there. Um, I know that uh, I just threw a lot out there, a lot of different types of options where I guess the, the, the key takeaway that I would say is that if you do have student loan debt, first, first and foremost, you're not alone because there are 45 million others of us out there in, in the country right now. And secondly, you're not alone in the sense that there are more and more people who are very invested and engaged and um, dri deriving a lot of meaning from trying to help. And so whether that's your employer, whether that's your loan holder, whether that's a federal government um, or other, other advocates out there, there are a lot of people who are trying to figure out how to make the loan situation that we have in this country more manageable for people. Thank you so much to you both. I think there was a lot of information to digest there and we've seen a number of great questions come through as well. So we'll just jump right into some of the questions that we have on hand and then a lot of the questions that are coming in through the Q&A. Um, so the first one, uh, either one of you can tackle this one, but um, young professionals in Boston today face a number of issues such as high healthcare costs, transportation challenges, rising housing costs, um, and as well as Boston being one of the most educated workforces, um, which has incredible strength, but also could lead to higher levels of student debt. What impact do you see um, on the competitiveness of greater Boston that student debt has? Um, and then also maybe Julie, this one might be more geared towards you. How do, you, how do young professionals experience student loan repayment in ways that might be different from older borrowers? In your research, you shared that Millennials are also um, the largest portion of caregivers. So how do those things kind of um, pile on, if you will? Yeah, Asha, do you wanna take this first or shall I go? You go ahead and start. Okay, great. 
So first thing I first thing I, I want to reiterate is that you know what our research at the Age Lab has shown is that is that borrowing and repaying loans at any age um, across the lifespan is challenging. That said, what we have seen in our research is that those challenges may be different for younger borrowers and older borrowers, um, you know, given where people are in, in their life stage. And so, for instance, if we just think about chronological age and someone's repayment horizon and someone's planning horizon, we know that younger borrowers have that, have just chronologically that much more time in which they're looking at, at um, um, right now, certainly what, what may feel like an uncertain future um, with many uh, goal posts ahead. And for everyone that's going to be different, for some people that's going to be purchasing a home, for some people that's going to be uh, having children or paying for childcare, uh, for some people maybe that's pursuing additional education, for some people maybe that's supporting aging parents or family members, it really depends. Um, but definitely what we know and what we've heard is that for younger borrowers, um, that the idea of planning for one future self is, is really complex, often more difficult than for older borrowers where let's say the idea of retirement, if that's on the table and that, you know, that changes uh, for different people, for some people that may be not working at all, for some people may be working somewhat, that's changing as we speak. Um, but for younger people, again, there, um, there, there may be more, um, more, more question marks there. The other thing I'll say, and we've heard this from our research is that Right now, um, the, the world that we're living in, um, in the United States anyway, with higher education, makes it such that uh, more borrowers are in either or both dual earning households and dual indebted households. So perhaps unlike older borrowers, if they took on loans um, in the 80s or 90s, let's say, or more recently, because certainly we know that older people are going back to school later in life or pursuing education at different points in their lives. Um, we know that many more younger borrowers are needing to have questions, um, are needing to have conversations with their spouse about, are these loans my loans? Are they our loans? Are your loans my loans? We also heard from a number of people in our focus groups that they actually didn't know about their, their spouse or partner's loans until they got married, let's say. So these are, these are all things that need to be on the table to talk about. And then the final thing that I wanna say is if we, if we just think um, historically, we know that both in terms of retirement planning and in terms of funding higher education, that the emphasis has moved in both domains more from society or for from institutions um, and more to the individual. And so in both cases, we know that younger borrowers, just by virtue of where they are um, in their repayment and in their retirement planning now, that that is something that they're sitting with. Thank you so much. I think that segues right into um, the, the last part of it, which was for Greater Boston, where that student loan debt might be higher just because it's such an educated workforce, have you seen in your research any impact on the competitiveness of that workforce in Greater Boston? I would certainly say, you know, and and I have a biased perspective in that uh, mo in that uh, most of the um, most direct research that we've done in terms of sitting with people um, in the room uh, was based in Cambridge, and so I would say certainly, you know, if I think back on some of the stories that we heard, um, you know, from borrowers who were saying um, either related to the job search itself, independent of student loans, um, or about navigating moves. Um, from employer to employer or from one field to the next, um, that certainly loans factored into all of those decisions about careers for sure. Absolutely. And I think a great question that comes up that might be a more philosophical approach question is how do you decide if it's better to put more money towards your student loans or into your 401k? And uh, Julie, you just touched on that. How do you balance retirement with getting rid of debt? You know, I think exactly what Asha was showing us, including with, with some of those models of what employers um, can be doing now and are doing now um, to help employees both repay their student loans and save for the future. Um, these are things that, again, we have heard uh, from participants in our research uh, and that we know from existing research are really important. You know, I, um, 
I hear the words of one participant um, continue to ring uh, in my mind, um, saying you can only point the fire hose at one thing at a time. And of course, that is how it feels. Um, or that, you know, it's understandable that, um, that anyone would feel that way, especially um, with higher uh, amounts of loans. And yet the idea is, um, especially now during this time, um, when there is at least temporary, temporary relief um, on student loan payments, the idea is to figure out how to make all things, including saving, um, not just for retirement, but for other life things, more possible while repaying student loans. Yeah, the other Absolutely. thing that I would add to that is um, is from an economic perspective. If and and to your point, uh, Haley, this is a it, there are a lot of factors in deciding what's right for you as the individual and how you manage your finances. But if you do look at it from from an economic perspective, which is definitely a huge part of it, um, the earlier that you're able to start investing in and saving in especially longer term horizon um, goals. So if it is retirement or even let's say, you know, you're, you're 23, 24, and you're, you're starting now to save towards a down payment for a house that you might buy 10 years from now, the earlier you're actually able to start doing that, the more you are likely to be able to earn on each dollar saved because the longer time you have, um, the, the more compounding interest you will be able to earn over that period of time. And so while it does seem like you can only do one thing at a time, and I think you know many of us have been there and many of us know what that feels like, the, the, what I would encourage you to do is, is try to figure out how you might be able to balance at least two things, like at least paying down your debt and saving in some way, shape or form, because the longer you wait to start saving, the harder it will then be for you to create that nest egg and to have that flexibility that you might really need later in your life. Absolutely. And I think that segues into the program that you touched on at the end there, Asha, which was the employer program. And so a question that came through is what advice can you share um, in your experience to help initiate the conversations for young professionals to engage with their employers? Do you see certain questions that the HR team or the management team may be asking um, as young professionals broach the topic? Yeah, so I think that there are a few different ways that you could think about this. So I, first of all, um, I started working in this space about five years ago, and I would say five years ago, many HR leaders were not very familiar with the student debt problem in the country and weren't really thinking about it as a workplace problem. That has really shifted in the past five years. So today, almost every HR leader that I speak with definitely knows and understands that student debt is a very real problem for their workforce. And whether or not they're, they're considering it in the near term, uh, many are aware of and have somewhere in their kind of sphere of consciousness, the fact that there are various types of student debt related benefit programs that might be able to be introduced into their company. So, so I say that because that's an encouraging thing for you, the employee, because there's already a little bit of an in. Chances are your HR leader already knows something about the student debt problem and the fact that there are different benefits out there. What I would suggest that you do is um, ask your employer if any sort of student debt benefit is a priority. And you might consider you know, thinking along with your HR team about how you could assess whether or not your uh, employee community would really value a benefit like this. So I know it from within Fidelity, we've done a variety of different things with different employers. Sometimes we help employers field surveys, or sometimes we look at demographic data, or sometimes we um, look at other forms of data that we have on that population. And all of that really just helps the employer, helps the HR team try to figure out, okay, if we roll out something related to student debt, how impactful will it be to what portion of our company? And I think that if, if you, the employee, really believe that um, it's not just for you, but it's for an entire community of people within your firm, which is most likely true, given just the broad numbers that we're seeing across the country, um, I think, you know, 
broaching the conversation that way would likely lead to better results. The other thing that I would say, and this is kind of true um, of all things, if you're trying to start something new, have the grit and the gumption, but also have the patience because it will take a little bit of time for this thing to become a reality. But I think if you're, if you're able to start pushing on that door, um, it could be something that maybe a year or two years from now could end up being incredibly important, not just to you, but to many other colleagues within your company. Thank you. And there was one follow-up question. Um, does Fidelity offer those services like the surveys um, for a fee that businesses and managers can engage in? Yeah, we, we do. And actually, um, some of them are for a fee and some of them are not for a fee. And some of them are free is what I'm trying to say. So um, if you work for a company that is interested in this, or if you yourself are an HR leader on this call that, that is interested in this, um, you can definitely reach out. We've included some of the links, um, but Fidelity does offer these services to help employers figure out the impact of the student debt problem within their company. Thank you so much. And a question for Julie, um, when you look at your research, um, have you taken a look at the marginalized groups or borrower, borrowers of color? Um, and do you see that they're impacted differently by student loans? Yes, absolutely. And, and um, you know, I would say both with our research and with existing research, including, um, you know, headlines in, in major news sources that, mm -hmm. um, that many people on, on this call may have seen, uh, we know that borrowers of color um, tend to take out higher amounts of loans. They tend to take longer to repay those loans and they tend to default more often. Um, these are inherently structural issues these are not um, these are not uh, coincidences. These are these are this is not at all a conversation about uh, individual uh, misdoings or errors. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to actually liken, um, you know, some of these some of these troubling rates that I just mentioned to the pandemic that we're currently living in, again, we're looking at disproportionate impacts, um, both in who is affected and to the extent to which people are affected. Um, and so we know that there are huge structural issues at play that need to be addressed. Um, and that hopefully um, in, hopefully in the future, um, maybe even in uh, the not too distant future, we will be seeing some of those, um, some of those improvements. We also know uh, if we look at our research and other research uh, that women, uh, including women uh, who are mothers, uh, including first generation college students, um, including uh, borrowers who identify as sexual and gender minorities, um, also experience, um, you know, differences in, in, both the, in both the amount of loans that they take on and how they repay those loans. Um, and so as Asha pointed out, I think the term financial empowerment um, and staring the elephant right in the face, um, we want to go back to that analogy, is so important. Um, and there, there are ways to be doing that, um, both within one's uh, existing networks and, and by tapping in uh, to outside resources as well. Yep. I think that segues um, really, really well into a question that came up in the Q&A, which was at a time when the world is, um, you know, focused on the pandemic and um, so much of the um, controversial elections and, and gender equity and the racial movement quality, um, what are the ways that, you know, borrowers can make sure that conversations around student debt are not lost? And that can go to either one of you. I can start on this one. Um, so one of the things that I'm observing in kind of the, uh, the broader community of employer-based conversations is, I think probably because of the pandemic, there's been a real increase of discussion of total wellness and total well-being. And a lot of people are considering the factors of total well-being to be um, physical, emotional, and financial. One of the key things that we know about student debt, and we've done a lot of research on this internally at Fidelity, and there are also a lot of other external resources um, and research that's pointing to the exact same thing, these three things, physical, emotional, and financial, are not siloed things. They're actually very intricately tied together. And in fact, um, some of the research that we have done shows 
that one of the biggest emotional stress drivers to people is taking out debt. And one of the biggest emotional stress relievers to people is to be able to pay off debt. And I think that that, that uh, tight linkage between your financial well being and then your well being overall as a human is something that is actually gaining a lot of conversation. And so I think in light of the pandemic, in light of the fact that everyone is so focused on health in all facets of our lives, being able to actually address something like debt um, is actually part of that conversation and, and a really important part of that conversation. And, and I would add to that, um, you know, I'm thinking about, about someone who a few months ago actually referred to this time for him as feeling like a rest time. Um, mm. That is not a word that I would necessarily use um, <laughs> personally for this, uh, for this time, but everyone is experiencing, um, you know, this time in our history very differently. If that is you, or if that is some version of you, this is the time, um, as Haile said, you know, to not let your student loans fall through the cracks among so many other um, stressors that may be happening. And so whether that is making sure um, that at your socially distance, um, you know, family gathering, um, you know, that, that if student loans, similar to um, about 90% of the borrowers in our study who said, I quote unquote, never talk about my loans with my family. If that, if you fall into that category, but if the loans actually feel relevant for you on any level, whether that is getting advice about repaying or simply um, as a reminder of like, oh, hey, I'm, I'm still repaying these loans. Um, this is a time perhaps to think about doing that. This is also a time to be making use of the fact that everything is happening online right now. Mm -hmm. And so many things are happening online right now that are free. So again, you know, in the spirit of not letting this maybe rest, maybe not rest time, um, you know, pass us by, um, this is a time to be, to be going online to, for you, what are trusted sources of information and not just finding one, but finding multiple. So vetting multiple sources of feedback or information seeing what other people have to say about how they're repaying their loans and saving for the future and managing um, you know, multiple other things in their lives. Um, this is the time to be connecting with people both in your immediate sphere, but also you know, the fact that we are so much more intri intricately connected than we've ever been. Absolutely, and I actually, um, there's a great question that came in that ties into that. You mentioned just now, Julie, and then Asha earlier as well, there's so many resources, right? And so vetting multiple sources and getting feedback. Um, and so the question is, as of 2018, 99% of public service loan forgiveness applicants were denied forgiveness, according to NPR. And so given these statistics, should people realistically count on that program as an avenue toward alleviating their debt burden? Um, or if you want to, if, expand upon some of those other resources that you touched on um, that folks can look into as well. Yeah, you know, public service loan forgiveness is, uh, it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one for me personally, because I started working in this space in about 2015, when there was so much promise associated with the public service loan forgiveness program. And now we're in 2020. And um, I look at those same stats and I look at them every year. And um, so here's the thing. The public service loan forgiveness program currently is problematic in, the in, in, in its administration. So there are many people who are not actually receiving the loan forgiveness that they expected to receive, um, or it is taking a lot longer for them to actually receive final approval. And there's pretty muddy data in terms of which one of those things is more, um, more, more dominant. Um, I think that what, what might happen over time is that we may see some restructuring of that program at large. And I, I say that probably will be true almost regardless of which admin, like how, how, how the administration of the next kind of president takes things forward. It's just the, 
the way that it is being administered today is, is probably not sustainable because it's not really working. Um, I do think that there are many people, particularly in Washington, who continue to be supporters of the, the, the ethos of the program. Um, so hopefully we will continue to see something or something like it continue, but uh, can you bank on it? <laughs> I think it's a, it's a hard call to make. What I would say though is this, in order to qualify for public service loan forgiveness, you first and foremost have to actually get on an income driven repayment plan. And getting on the income driven repayment plan could end up being just a really good idea for you no matter what. So if you kind of take it from a one step at a time perspective, um, perhaps if you're a person who is working in the public sector, who is looking to kind of manage monthly payments among all like the rest of your life, get on that income driven repayment program first, continue to manage your paperwork for public service loan forgiveness, know that there is uncertainty, but at least take it one year at a time. And if three or four years from now, public service loan forgiveness is not looking promising at all, you can then change course. At least you will know that you've had three or four years of managing your loans at a monthly payment that works for you within an income driven repayment program that largely is probably a good idea for you. That's unfortunately the best that I can say right now, just given the, the broader uncertainty around a lot of these things. This is also so timely because um, I'm, I'm actually just working on uh, a paper now with um, with some colleagues about the idea of student loan forgiveness and asking the question, is it magical thinking? Um, as in, is it is it optimistic? Is it almost kind of superstitious to be making payments if you don't necessarily have the, the national evidence to back up that you're going to get that return? And that's really tricky. And I know it's kind of a grim question to ask. We do know um, that initially the success rate for having one's loans forgiven nationally uh, was 0.03%. We know that recently we are up to a whopping 1.05% of people who have applied for student loan forgiveness who have actually had those loans forgiven. So nationally, you know, we, if one were to look at those statistics, they would say, hmm, I don't know if it actually makes that much sense for me to count on having my loans forgiven. In the survey that I mentioned, actually, um, we did ask people, are you counting on having your loans forgiven? And of those who said yes, we then asked them, how confident are you that your loans will actually be forgiven? What we learned is that only about 25% of people who are counting, quote, counting on student loan forgiveness are actually very confident that their loans will be forgiven. And so it's, it is this very tricky, tricky spot. And, and that is to ask, should I be optimistic that essentially my government, that the Department of Education is going to, um, is going to actually um, deliver on its promise? Uh, or do I need to be as wary as I think I might need to be? And so just as Asha was saying, you know, I think making sure to the extent that you are able, if student loan forgiveness is something that you are counting on, to the extent that you are able to make sure that you have as much documented as possible, that you have your employment verification mm -hmm. forms in each year, you know, everything to make sure that if there are any cracks um, that you can fall through, that you are in as much control as possible, that um, that is the name of the game. And I also do think about a colleague of mine uh, with whom I've worked uh, on that paper who has said, you know what, these national statistics that we've seen, these are a thing of the past. We actually need to be looking um, at more optimistic statistics moving forward for, for people who, who will have their loans forgiven as more people are learning what it actually means to be qualified to have your loans forgiven. And again, as we as we move into a new administration and seeing what happens um, with that as well. Yeah, I think you also need to think about your alternatives. So like what if you're not if you're not gearing yourself towards public service loan forgiveness and you work in the public sector, what else would you be doing? Like, would you be refinancing your loan as an example? Or would you be chucking as much extra payment as you possibly can towards your loan on a monthly basis? And, and I think kind of weighing those, those types of things out, like 
if those are actually viable options for you, then maybe, maybe, yeah, those are worth consideration. If you can't, if you're not in a situation where you're really able to put a ton of extra payments towards your student loan to begin with, if you're not in a situation where private refinancing makes sense with you to begin with, then going down the income driven repayment route might just be the safest bet for now. And then you can wait for a year or two or three and then reassess your options at that point and figure out the strategy to move forward with at that point. So that's the problem. Like all these things we're talking about 10 year horizons, so much can change in 10 years. You might change your career in 10 years. The government might change its mind in 10 years. So it's very hard to say with certainty something of a, a, when you're, when you're thinking about a 10 year horizon. So it's, I think, I don't know, think about, think about the 10 years. Yes. But also think about like, okay, what are my options available to me now? What makes sense for me now? And use that as part of your consideration as you're thinking about it. I love that answer because I think that sometimes um, folks can think about student debt as, um, you know, a blanket kind of idea, but really it's very unique to every individual, right? Um, there, we have a number of questions asking, you know, should I refinance? Does it make sense for me now? What are the rates? All of that. So I would encourage all of you, if you have personal questions, a lot of times your company, um, if you have a 401k plan, those plan servicers will actually have some financial counseling that you can reach out to through your employer. And so tying into that well-being um, and the financial well-being all being part of you know, your health there, um, I would highly encourage you to reach out to your HR person or visit your intranet and see what resources there are. Those financial planners and consultants will be able to take a look at each unique situation and really help guide you to making some solid decisions, whether it be um, you know, swapping up your 401k contribution or putting more towards your loan, like Asha said. So I encourage you, if you have those personalized questions, to reach out to them so that you can get a very, um, you know, customized um, kind of answer there. And so um, I think we have time for one more question on the Q&A. And Julie, this goes to your research. You mentioned that in the survey, you found that um, folks did answer that it was worth it, right? And so when you take up such a huge amount of debt sometimes, um, you know, what's the trade off that folks are saying to kind of justify that it was worth it for them personally? You know, it's such a good question. Um, you know, having heard about so many of the challenges that come with repaying student loans, what does make it worth it? Um, certainly, you know, the, the answer uh, varied from, from person to person. Uh, overall, you know, the value of a college degree persists, and research shows that. Um, you know, we look at uh, median income, if we look at median retirement savings, we know that having a college degree, and we also need to put a caveat here that not everyone with student loans winds up then getting a college degree. And, and these are the folks who uh, wind up being in the most peril in terms of uh, default and other ne negative outcomes with loans. Um, but that said, the experience uh, of, of a college ed education, certainly a, a college degree, um, for some, we, we heard, um, made the loans feel worth it. Uh, for some others, particularly those um, who were first-generation college students, um, the, the ability to say, not just for myself, but for my parents who worked so hard mm -hmm. to get me here, um, you know, I, yeah, I, I have a college, I have a college degree, um, you know, and also, of course, um, we heard from others saying that essentially the responsibility of having a loan, while most said that it came with really, um, you know, often negative outcomes, that the responsibility of having a loan felt like a privilege. And, and we did hear that. I, I would say that we heard that more often from parents uh, who, were re who may have been repaying loans for children, but we certainly also heard that uh, from some younger borrowers who had loans for themselves. So I would say, you know, it was a mixed bag depending on everyone's different experience. It's a good question. And so we'll, we'll wrap up with one final question to you both. Um, and so during a time where the future still seems unclear, worrying about finances and student loans can be a heavy burden on the minds of young professionals. So in a few closing words, how do you recommend that our audience members stay optimistic about what the future holds? Asha, you wanna go for it? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, 
You know, I do think that there is a lot to be optimistic about. And I think that the main reason for that is actually kind of getting to what Julie said. So, so yes, it's true. Student loan debt is growing at a very rapid pace in this country. Yes, more and more people are in debt. The other thing that is true is that more and more people are actually receiving a college education than ever before. We are as a country actually upskilling ourselves. And I think that that is actually setting us up to make some pretty huge and systemic change that's, that, that will hopefully set us up for an even more and brighter future. And um, I think that there is a lot to, to be said for using the degree, using the education that you receive to then actually transform the world around us. And that is something to, to be optimistic about. And yes, you may have to pay off that degree for some time, but just think of all, hopefully, all the things that you can actually do with it now that you have it and the community of people that you gain to kind of work alongside you in that change making that you might want to go out there to do. So um, I would focus back on, on the education itself and the value of that for society. And that is what really makes me more optimistic than ever. And building on, on what Asha just mentioned, I would say also um, financial literacy builds. And if we mm -hmm. think about these cross-generational ways in which financial literacy can build, we know, again, just thinking about our own research, that, um, that the majority of borrowers said, I didn't know anything about these loans that I was taking out when I took them out, especially for those who were 22 and under when they did take yep. them out. So if we can look at some kind of silver lining with the situation, what we can certainly hope is that as now a generation where you know 70 percent of the graduating class of 2016 had student loans if you think about what that means for the children and the children's children and the children's children, children etc in terms of their financial savvy whether it is loan related or not hopefully that's good news um this also you know as we've all said is a time um, where where borrowers can be looking to different sources for advice. Uh, we know, and again, we've heard this in our research, that um, student loan borrowers in particular, trust is really important. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is a time to figure out um, who those trusted sources of information are. And, and there are many, and they do exist. Um, we know that people often like to hear from people that they can relate most to. And so again, this is an opportunity to go online. If you don't necessarily feel comfortable approaching uh, a bank or your servicer or some kind of existing um, financial entity, go to people who you trust, maybe people, yep. people who you know already, um, and ask what's working for them. You know, we, we need to make this less of a taboo topic. And when I say this, I mean finances and repaying student loans. Um, and this is the time to do it. This is also the time to really get to know your loans, um, you know, and, and it is in your power to do that, to really um, gain more of a sense of control. And the final thing I'll say that, that hopefully we can feel optimistic about um, is policy changes that will hopefully be coming in the pipeline. So whether that is related to uh, a student loan bill of rights, whether that is related to uh, more widespread uh, student loan relief, so hopefully higher rates of student loan forgiveness, um, I think that we can keep our fingers crossed um, that there will be some change moving forward. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your incredible insight to the both of you. I think hearing your research, Julie, was so fascinating. And like you said earlier, I wish I could just dive into more of it. And Asha, those resources that you shared, I think, opened the eyes to so many folks on the phone who might not even realize that employers have those options and they as employees have that option to broach the topic as well. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, thank you again to our sponsors, Bar Foundation, John Hancock, and P&G Gillette for making this conversation possible. If anyone has any follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to us at chamberprograms at bostonchamber.com. We'd love to have you join us for more important discussions like this. So head to cityawake.org or follow City Awake on social media. And with that, we hope you enjoy your weekend and have a happy Friday the 13th. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.